When Sandra and I were together for the seventh year, a close male friend appeared in her life. They talked about everything and had great rapport. Every night, Sandra would make two desserts by hand, one for me, and one to take to him. But there was never anything inappropriate, until one day, that man asked her, if I had met you first, would you have married me? Sandra didn't answer but smashed the vase I had given her. Sandra has been absent-minded all day today. She wanted to say something several times but held back. In the end, I spoke first. Did something happen? Sandra frowned slightly and said cautiously, Lily's husband is on a business trip, and she's home alone and scared. She wants me to keep her company, but your arm is seriously injured, and I'm worried about leaving you alone. I should ask her to find another girlfriend. She spoke sincerely, her tone half worried and half caring. While she was talking, I kept looking at her. Her eyes were clear and pure, meeting my gaze directly without dodging. After a moment of silence, she asked softly, What's wrong? I shook my head and said, Nothing. You can go. What about you? Alone. I'll ask my mom to come over and take care of me. I had a minor car accident recently and broke my arm. Sandra was terrified. She cried outside the operating room while I was having surgery, whether in the hospital or at home. She took meticulous care of me, wanting to be by my side 24 hours a day. At night, when my arm hurt too much to sleep, she would stay up, crying at the bedside, sometimes gently rubbing my other hand with her cheek, sometimes wiping the sweat off my forehead with a towel. I saw all this and worried that she would tire herself out and get sick, so I told her to rest early. She told me, how can I sleep when you're like this? What if something happens and I don't find out immediately? I'd have nightmares. Your hand is for designing houses. If anything happens, I'd regret it for the rest of my life. Then she pouted and asked, don't you want me to stay with you? During the day, even if she had to go out for work, she would wait until my mom came over, repeatedly reminding her to take good care of me, going over all the details again and again. It made my mom laugh and cry. This is my own son. How could I neglect him? But today, she hesitated for only two seconds before nodding. Take care of yourself. I'll be back as soon as possible. Call me first if anything happens. Don't make me worry. She left in a hurry. She only took a change of clothes and left quickly. I sat there without moving. Even smiled and waved at her when she looked back. When the door closed, I still didn't move. But my stiff back relaxed. Sandra was acting strange. From beginning to end. She was acting strange, but I didn't say an extra word or ask an extra question, because I knew where she was going and who she was going to meet. At first, I didn't know the man's name. I only knew his surname was Ito, and Sandra called him Manager Ito. The first time I saw him was a year ago. I was waiting for Sandra at a newly opened cafe downstairs from her company. I didn't notify her in advance, planning to call her at noon, but she suddenly walked in. The previously lazy receptionist straightened up. Sandra gave him a bright smile. He nodded with a smile. It was a silent understanding. I've always thought that understanding between a man and a woman is a very scary thing. It makes both sides think they are destined for each other. But at that time, the strange feeling just flashed through my mind, and I didn't think much about it. Later, Sandra saw me and was very surprised. She asked why I was there. I said, waiting to have lunch with you. Why didn't you call me? I said, I didn't want to interrupt your work. Why did you come down? She pouted and said, work stuff, a bit annoying. So I came down for a walk and a cup of coffee to refresh. By the way, the cookies here are delicious. You should try them. She raised her hand and said, Manager, Ito, another plate of cookies. Facing his puzzled gaze, she introduced with a smile, My husband. That day, they were both very calm. Sandra introduced him calmly. Makoto greeted me calmly and even waved our bill. Sandra said the coffee here was authentic. And after trying it once and finding it good, her company decided to get their afternoon tea from here. Over time. They got familiar with each other. At that time, I thought they were just a simple shopkeeper and customer. I didn't know that those delicious cookies were not sold in their store. I also didn't know that Makoto would send Sandra a message, asking her, if I had met you first, would you have married me? Sandra sent me a message at 10 o'clock at night. She said she just had hot pot with Lily and was about to rest. She said she was so tired and wouldn't video call me tonight. She asked me to take care of myself and call her if anything happened. I replied to her, telling her not to worry. I was fine. I asked the cafe server, where's manager, Ito, why isn't he here? The young girl, not thinking much, smiled and said, he went out, left as soon as he went downstairs, today is our boss's birthday, he must be on a date with his girlfriend, carrying a big bouquet of roses, so romantic. I nodded, took a coffee to go, and left, this city is huge, finding two people is difficult, but Sandra once bought me a smartwatch, I had slipped it into her handbag before she left. She bought it for me last year. When others were tying small rubber bands on their loved ones' hands, 
She gave me a smartwatch. This way, I can always know where you are. I want to check on you. Will you let me? She said it coyly, but I knew she cared more about the health monitoring than the location tracking. I had fainted from overwork once, and she was scared to death. She wanted to monitor my condition in real time. Of course, I gladly accepted her concern. That smartwatch was expensive, accurately monitoring my heart rate and pulse, and had precise location tracking. Just like now, it had been on the 12th floor of this hotel for three hours. I didn't rush over immediately. My arm hurt a bit, so I took a painkiller and a melatonin, lying on the soft bed, listening to white noise for sleep. But even so, I couldn't sleep. Just like that night over a month ago, that was the first time I checked Sandra's phone, because she seemed very disturbed. She cut her hand while peeling an apple for me, spilled a glass of water while pouring it. In an instant, her emotions seemed to collapse, hysterically sweeping everything off the table, including the vase I had customized for her for our wedding anniversary. Looking at the mess, I was silent. Sandra finally calmed down. Looking at the broken vase, she showed a look of regret. She turned to look at me, seeming to want to say something. But in the end, she didn't say a word and quietly started to clean up. Later, I woke up in the middle of the night, and she wasn't there. The dim light in the living room was on. Sandra had drunk several glasses of red wine. Her body slumped on the sofa, her long hair hanging loosely over the edge, her face full of tears, even soaking the cushion she was lying on. At that moment, my heart was slow and heavy. With a dying heart, I unlocked her phone. The chat window was still open. That person with only the remark Ito had sent a message in the afternoon. If I had met you first, would you have married me? Sandra didn't reply. She didn't reply a single word. But that night, my heart died in her phone. I arrived at the hotel at 6 a.m. with my ID. I placed all my belongings at the front desk. Sandra is my wife, and I want to know which room she booked. If you refuse, I'll call the police. I didn't have the energy to argue with anyone. I was exhausted, physically and mentally drained. The receptionist was stunned for a long time. Her gaze turned from surprise to hesitation and then to pity. Please wait a moment. I'll check for you right away. She quickly gave me the room number. She also asked if I needed any help. I smiled and shook my head. Gathering my things, I went upstairs. Sandra didn't keep me waiting long. I had been standing outside the door for less than 40 minutes when the door opened. Makoto stood there, holding the doorknob, looking dejected, behind him. A slender hand rested on his arm. A voice came through. Makoto, thank you, but I'm sorry. We really can't do this. Thank you. Thank you for what? Sorry. What are you sorry for? It seemed like a secret code between them. A look of sadness appeared on Makoto's face. Sandra. I. Alex. The air seemed to freeze at that moment. Sandra's hand, which was resting on Makoto's arm, retracted as if burned. But she didn't come out from behind Makoto. I asked. Are you not leaving? Alex. Sandra's face was pale, her voice trembling. So was I. The hand I had behind my back was shaking. I thought I was mentally prepared and could handle this calmly. But when the moment came, I realized I could barely stand. It felt like all my strength disappeared in an instant. And I weakly asked, where's the car? In the underground parking lot. Let's go. My arm, in a sling, accidentally hit the wall. The pain made me gasp. Alex. Sandra hurried to support me. I growled. Don't touch me. But she kept her head down, stubbornly refusing to listen. I raised my hand, intending to push her away. Suddenly, Makoto stepped forward, pulling Sandra behind him. What are you going to do? I sneered. Do what? What do you think I'm going to do? Hit her. He stood tall, like a defender of justice, in front of Sandra and said to me, I won't let you touch her. I nodded. Fine. Then keep her. Just remind her to divorce me first. Sandra shook off Makoto's hand and shouted, Alex, let's go home. Makoto feeling hurt, said, I'm trying to help you. Sandra took a step back, Makoto, I have nothing to do with you, I don't need your help. She didn't even give Makoto a glance, only looking at me, and spoke again, Alex, let's go home. Alex, I can explain, yesterday was Makoto's birthday, he doesn't have friends here, so he wanted me to keep him company, I just spent his birthday with him, nothing happened between us, it was wrong of me to lie to you, and I apologize, I was just afraid you would be angry and overthink things. I was wrong. If you mind, I won't see him again. He's just a friend. Alex, please don't ignore me. Say something. Okay. Don't scare me. Since we got home, Sandra has said a lot. Explanations. Apologies. Self-reproach. I wanted to speak, but it felt like my throat was stuffed with cotton. I couldn't get a single word out. I didn't know where to start, or what to say. Finally, I said, word by word, Sandra, let's get a divorce. My words made Sandra tremble violently. She clenched the hem of her clothes and closed her eyes tightly. 
When she opened them again, it seemed like she suppressed her overwhelming emotions. She said, Nothing happened between us. We just drank and chatted. Alex, don't be like this. Okay, I know you're angry. I was wrong. I shouldn't have gone out with him. But you have to believe me. I didn't do anything to betray you. What does it mean to betray me? I said calmly. You probably hugged. Right. Maybe even kissed. You smell of smoke. And here, I pointed at her lips. A bite mark. Sandra was stunned. Her lips tightened. I looked at her with sadness. How far does it have to go? Caught in bed. You were in the same room all night. How can you expect me to believe you? Sandra. How can I trust you? Sandra's head drooped in defeat. She closed her eyes. Her eyelashes trembling gently. Her voice choked as she said. Alex. I was wrong. I don't know what happened to me. I lost my mind. But I swear. Nothing more happened between us. I beg you. For the sake of our years together. Give me another chance. Besides. I'm pregnant. We're about to have a baby. She took my hand and placed it on her stomach. I froze, slowly looking down at her stomach. Confusion. A moment of confusion. I suddenly pulled my hand back. What did you say? I'm pregnant. When did you find out? Sandra fell silent, her hand clenching into a small, bloodless fist. I gritted my teeth, feeling like a trapped beast. My voice was hoarse and trembling as I asked. You knew but didn't tell me. You knew and still spent the night with Makoto. Sandra, what are you thinking? You don't want this baby, do you? Because of Makoto. Right. You bitch. How dare you? How dare you use this baby as a bargaining chip now? Divorce. Sandra. Don't say another word. This year marks the seventh year of Sandra and me being together. People said. Aren't you guys in the seven year itch? I laughed. We've only been married for three years. But you've been together for seven years already. Maybe it's time to have a baby. But in reality. We've never used contraception from the beginning. For a while. Sandra was very anxious about this. She couldn't understand why she couldn't get pregnant. We went to the hospital for various tests. The results showed that our chances of having children were low. My data was all normal. The problem was with her. To prevent Sandra from being affected. Whenever people asked why we didn't have children. I would say. I haven't had enough of the two of us yet. No one can take Sandra from me. We both looked forward to having a child. I used to imagine that if one day we found out Sandra was pregnant. We would be overjoyed. But she didn't tell me. She got pregnant. She had a checkup. But she didn't tell me. I didn't even need to think deeply. I knew she hesitated. Hesitated about whether to keep the baby. Why? Because of Makoto's appearance. The appearance of another man made her uncertain whether she wanted to have a child with me. How ridiculous. How pathetic. Strong emotions surged through my nerves. Wave after wave. Finally. I vomited. I clung to the toilet. Kneeling on the floor. It was a pain that felt like my organs had shifted. Sandra pounded on the door desperately. She begged me to open the door. Begged me to come out. She pleaded softly outside the door. Asking me not to joke about my health. And I sat there. Disheveled. Feeling like the most failed man in the world. I wanted to end it all with dignity. But my dignity had been trampled on the moment Sandra began to waver. That night. I slept in the guest room. Maybe I was too tired. I fell asleep quickly. Early the next morning. Before I woke up. Sandra had prepared a full breakfast. When I came out. She stood up with a forced smile. She probably didn't sleep well. She looked terrible, her lips colorless. In the past, I would have felt heartbroken, but now, my heart felt like a pool of dead water. Alex, eat something. I said expressionlessly. Sandra, let's talk. She stood there for a long time, then finally nodded. Okay, where should I start? I said to Sandra, I gave you a chance. I even imagined that things might not have to go that far. Sandra was stunned, looking at me with some confusion. I sneered. That day, Makoto asked you, if you had met him first, would you have married him? Because of that one sentence. You broke down. Cried hysterically. When you passed out drunk on the sofa that night. I had already looked at your phone. I always thought that looking through a partner's phone wasn't a good thing to do. Once you start doing that. The distance has already formed. If there's no trust between two people. Why stay together? But with that mindset. I still ended up doing it. My words made Sandra freeze. Her body leaned back slightly. It was a subconscious attempt to escape. She clutched the hem of her clothes. Showing a pleading expression, her weak voice barely audible, but I didn't reply to him. I rubbed my sore eyes and said, yes, you didn't reply, but not replying is also an answer. The suffocating silence filled the room again. Sandra opened her mouth several times to speak. Finally, she said, if you saw those messages, you should understand that I had never crossed any line with him before. I just treated him as a friend the night before last. I drank too much, which messed up my emotions, but it stopped there. It didn't go any further. Alex. I really didn't betray you. I didn't look at Sandra. Just exhaled a long breath. On April 3rd, 
We had agreed to go to the movies. It had been a long time since we last went. I bought the tickets, reserved a restaurant, and was really looking forward to it. But you suddenly said you didn't have time because your boss insisted you work overtime. But in reality, it was Makoto who asked you to go singing. Every night, you would make two desserts at home. One to keep for me in the evening and one to take to him in the morning. The only exception was on February 14th, when you took matcha chocolates. 13 pieces of chocolate. The elevator in your building requires an internal card. Makoto complained that it took a long time to wait for the elevator every time he delivered food. So you told your boss that your husband needed a card to pick you up when you worked late. But you actually gave it to him. On your birthday. After I fell asleep, you went downstairs at midnight. And Makoto gave you a bracelet. He asked you if he was the first to wish you a happy birthday. And you said yes. Your tacit understanding is, he says go. And you say go. You mention a penthouse. He replies with a one. You say you're sleepy. He says the coffee is on the way. When you changed cars, you took him for a test drive. He said someone mistook you for a couple. And you sent a shy facepalm emoji. Every day on your way home from work, you chat with him for 27 minutes. How long has it been since we talked that much in one day? Except during our honeymoon phase. The Sandra who chats with Makoto is a stranger to me. No. I shouldn't say stranger, the Sandra from university was like that, lively, talkative, even a bit childish, but the person on the other side was no longer me, that feeling of ants gnawing at my skin almost consumed me, Sandra's head hung lower and lower, she said weakly, I just saw him as a confidant, when I was feeling down, I would occasionally want to chat with someone, we were just chatting, Alex, what will it take for you to believe me, a deep sense of powerlessness pulled me down, Sandra, how far does it have to go to be considered cheating, your closeness, your understanding, is like a guillotine hanging over my head, is it cheating when the blade falls, or when you hang it above me, the bullet was already in the chamber before the trigger was pulled, I had fantasies, I love Sandra, we've been together for 7 years, I remember every bit of what she did for me, how could she betray me for such a person, but when I turned off my phone and lay down, I knew some things couldn't be ignored, after seeing those messages, after discovering all that, how could I still trust you, when you leave my sight and do something unusual, I know you're going to see him. At that moment, I knew our relationship had already been buried by you. Until Sandra agreed to see Makoto one last time. To drink with him one last time. He said, maybe this way I can let go. Sandra, please pity me. Sandra replied, okay. At that moment, the trigger was pulled. I was reborn through death. Sandra, let's get a divorce. Sandra disagreed. She said she was willing to make any compromise. Except for divorce. She said she would always make desserts only for me have lunch downstairs at my company, come home on time every day, and never step into the cafe again. Watching her busy and eager to please, I felt very sad. This was all unnecessary. I never liked compensations after the fact. Divorce is hard. I only realized how hard it is when I wanted to get divorced. When one party disagrees, you have to file a lawsuit. From filing to trial takes at least a month. If there is no major fault, the first trial won't grant the divorce. Then you have to wait six months and file again. Will it be granted the second time? Probably. Maybe. Perhaps. It's torturous. So I decided to move out. What are you doing? Where are you going? I ignored Sandra's words and continued packing my clothes into the suitcase. She went crazy, throwing my things around. What more do you want from me? I've already admitted my mistakes, apologized, and promised there won't be a next time. Why are you still unforgiving? Am I so unforgivable? Can't you give me just one chance for the sake of our years together? Alex, I'm begging you. Can't we be okay? The clothes in my hand wrinkled from my grip. I threw them hard on the floor. Sandra, I'm begging you too. Stop disgusting me. Sandra was scared, stepping back with red-rimmed eyes. She clutched her stomach and held onto the door frame. I won't divorce you. I'm pregnant. You can't divorce me. That was the last thing she said before she fainted. Threatened miscarriage. If symptoms worsen, it could lead to a miscarriage. The doctor's diagnosis was due to emotional upheaval and excessive worry. Her parents rushed over. They scolded me harshly. Questioned how I was taking care of Sandra. Asked if I was bullying her. Causing her stress. I was too tired. Too exhausted to even speak. Sandra looked at them nervously and said. Dad. Mom. Stop it. Alex. I slowly raised my head. Looking at the family of three in front of me. I want a divorce from Sandra. What did you say? I said I want a divorce from Sandra. You bastard. Her dad got angry and swung a punch at my face. But I grabbed his arm tightly. Sandra screamed. Trying to intervene but her mom held her back. You've spoiled him too much. You're pregnant, and he wants a divorce. Does he have someone else outside? Sandra stood still. I sneered and said, Sandra, this marriage is over. Because of this commotion, everyone knew about my desire to divorce Sandra. At first, my parents didn't understand, 
until I told them the real reason. Suddenly, they all fell silent. Sandra's parents didn't come looking for me either. They must have learned the truth. Only Sandra persisted. During her hospital stay, she called me many times, but I didn't answer any of them. She then called my parents. At first, their tone wasn't good, but as Sandra showed weakness and repeatedly mentioned the child, my parents wavered. Maybe, let it go. After all, Sandra is pregnant. Chapter 9 Asterisk. Yes, Sandra is pregnant. Everyone thinks this should be a get out of jail free card, but in reality, it's the last straw that broke the camel's back. I loved her so much, I wholeheartedly looked forward to the arrival of our child, but what about her? She stabbed me in the back, bleeding profusely, deep enough to see the bone. The feeling of being betrayed by someone you love torments me every second. I hate her. I no longer trust her. How can I spend the rest of my life with her? Do I have to wait until the marriage rots to the core to end it? Sandra stayed in the hospital for 15 days. Makoto visited once. He brought a fruit basket and flowers, saying he was there to check on her. But for the first time, Sandra looked at him coldly. Leave. Don't come back. Makoto was silent for a few seconds, then forced a smile and asked. What do you mean? You're not answering my calls or messages. What? We can't even be friends anymore. Does Mr. Wong still have a misunderstanding? I can go explain to him. I. Makoto. Sandra interrupted him. Let's not contact each other anymore. I wouldn't have known this. But Makoto came to tell me himself. He smoked. His face full of despair. I thought I could win her over. You just showed up a bit earlier than me. But now. I've lost. I give up. She's yours. His self-pity made me laugh. Did Sandra send you? Makoto smirked. Her last request to me. Of course. I'll fulfill it. Really? A deep love without regret. I called Sandra. As soon as she picked up, she said, Alex, I can be discharged soon. You'll come to pick me up. Right. I said, abort it. What? The baby. Sandra cried, sobbing uncontrollably. Do you hate me so much that you want to kill our child? Sandra, I spoke calmly. If you have this child, and someday they ask why their parents divorced, what will you tell them? Yes. Whether it's during her pregnancy or breastfeeding, I can't divorce her even if I file a lawsuit. But these periods will pass, and I will definitely divorce her. Sandra choked out. Why? I've already apologized to you. I've humbled myself, begged you in tears. What more do you want? Just for making one mistake, do I deserve a death sentence? Can't you give me one chance? Alex, is your heart made of stone? This was the first time she decisively hung up on me. She said, I won't abort the baby, and I won't divorce you. Chapter 11 Asterisk Sandra was discharged from the hospital. She went home but didn't contact me. However, her mother called me repeatedly. At first, her tone was kind. Then, she became angry and ashamed. Alex, you're a man. Can't you be a bit more forgiving? Sandra just had a male friend. Nothing actually happened. Do you really have to be so unforgiving? How ugly. I had already prepared for worse. But then came the news that Sandra's mother was hospitalized. What happened? I asked a friend. He shook his head. Not sure. Seems she had a fight with Sandra's dad. No one knows the exact reason. How is she now? She's awake. But crying and screaming. Saying she wants to die. I breathed a sigh of relief. Glad she was awake. My mom asked. Aren't you going to visit? I was busy with work and didn't look up. No. Since I've decided to part ways, there's no point in giving false hope. It's strange. It seems people can grow up overnight. At first, I thought Sandra's betrayal would make me want to die. That I would be in unbearable pain. But as days passed, it didn't hurt as much. I started to face the reality that my marriage had failed. I didn't plan to visit Sandra's mother. But she called me. Saying she wanted to see me. I don't mean anything else. Alex. I just have some things I want to say to you. Her voice was sad and hoarse. It made me hesitate for a long time. But in the end, I went. In just a few days, Sandra's mother looked visibly haggard. And Sandra too. She had lost a lot of weight. Looking like she might collapse at any moment. Lost. Helpless. In pain. She said. Alex. Thank you. Thank you for coming to see my mom. I nodded at her and walked into the hospital room. Sandra's father cheated. More accurately. He found true love and wants a divorce. And his so-called true love is two years younger than Sandra. He said he had never felt so in sync with anyone before. They eat together, fish together, travel together, and have endless conversations. He said he feels alive again. He said he sacrificed his whole life for this family. So why can't he live for himself just once? Sandra's mother became more agitated as she spoke. He said he only feels responsibility towards me and this family. It's me and this family that have held him back. How dare he? Hasn't he ever thought about my sacrifices? How can he negate all our years together with just a few words? He's cheating. And yet he tries to make it sound so noble. 
I won't let them be together. I'd rather die than let them be together. If he wants to divorce me and be with his new lover. No way. Sandra's mother grabbed my hand, trembling. Alex, you understand me, right? You get what I'm going through, don't you? Only you know what I've been through. He's driving me to death. With her words, I finally understood why she wanted to see me and tell me all this. It turns out you really can't understand the pain until it happens to you. Before, she casually brushed off Sandra's mistake, saying it was just a minor conflict, and blamed me for being petty. But now, when it's happening to her, she says it's driving her to death. I didn't offer comfort or kick her when she was down. After she finished speaking, I pushed her hand away, facing her hopeful gaze. I said flatly, rest well, I have things to do, so I'll be leaving now, Alex. When I stepped out of the hospital room, Sandra was standing outside. She looked at me with longing in her eyes. Can we talk? Talk? Talk about what? Even with the divorce, I just wanted to resolve it, not talk about it. I have two questions for you. First, if your dad hadn't mentioned divorce but had a close female friend, would you empathize with your dad or feel sorry for your mom? Second, your dad's close relationship with this woman didn't just start. Why did he bring up divorce now? After saying this, ignoring Sandra's barely controlled emotions, I walked away. Chapter 13 Asterisk Sandra's father was determined. He was willing to leave with nothing just to get divorced. This shocked everyone. For a long time, a loving family and a good background were Sandra's labels. She had never faced hardships from her family. Her father was someone she admired and depended on. She always said she wanted to marry someone like her father. As for her mother, gentle and calm, she was someone Sandra aspired to be. After graduating, she used her family's connections to enter a company and is now a mid-level manager. So, she hadn't faced many social hardships. The only real turmoil was probably our divorce. I understood Sandra. She knew she was wrong but didn't think she was that wrong. She chose to admit her mistake, thinking that just admitting it would be enough. What's the big deal? But her father's situation seemed to wake her up suddenly. She hadn't contacted me for many days, but she would often appear outside our neighborhood. Her car would be parked there for hours. Until one day, she called out to me. We sat on a bench by the road. After a long silence, Sandra spoke. I've thought a lot about the questions you asked me. Later, I asked him why he wanted a divorce now. He said it was because my mom's attitude made him feel that having a close female friend was acceptable. He also thought I could understand him falling for someone else and wouldn't blame him, because I did the same. Since that was the case, he thought we wouldn't mind if he asked for a divorce. As Sandra said this, her hands trembled. So did her voice. I went to see that girl, trying to persuade her to break up with my dad. But she said, she said, that girl said, don't you have a close male friend too? You didn't even want to have a baby because of him. The only difference is you weren't brave enough. In that regard, you should learn from your dad. How could he do that? They were in love all this time. And the day before he asked for a divorce, he hugged my mom before leaving. Sandra buried her face in her hands. She cried. Cried for her father's betrayal of their marriage and family. But her tears didn't stir any pity in me. Alex, do you hate me that much? My hand on the bench tightened. And a thorn pricked my finger, causing pain. I recalled those unpleasant experiences. At first, I was sad. Discovering you had such a close male friend, I was very sad. Later, when he confessed and you didn't respond, I was confused. I thought, at least you hadn't betrayed me, right? But you didn't cut ties. You continued to do those things, which made me suffer, until you agreed to meet him that night. I suddenly felt relieved. They say the person involved is often the last to see it. You didn't respond to his confession, not because you didn't want to, but because you couldn't. So you broke down, felt miserable and cried. Even knowing he had feelings for you, you didn't keep your distance because you couldn't let go. You agreed to drink with him because you had other thoughts. What stopped you? Probably your last shred of moral decency. Sandra, when I realized you liked him, I hated you. Sandra looked at me with pain in her eyes, but I felt a sense of relief, but all that's in the past. Hatred is too intense. It hurts others and oneself. It's unnecessary. Sandra, if you really feel sorry for me, then decisively agree to the divorce and leave us both some dignity. At the end of our conversation, Sandra wiped away her tears. Do you have time tomorrow? Accompany me for the abortion. Just consider it the last time you'll be with me. Sandra and I divorced on a sunny morning. She asked, can we still be friends after the divorce? I shook my head. Let's not. We both need to start over. Sandra wanted to smile, but in the end, she cried. Alex, I'm sorry. I accepted those three words calmly. I turned and left without looking back. Sandra's parents were still causing a scene. I heard her father had already set up a home elsewhere. Her mother argued and cursed every day, but it couldn't change her father's determination. So she started blaming Sandra, saying it was Sandra who set the example and influenced her father. One dramatic scene after another. I didn't need to see it myself. Countless people related to me. 
At first, I still ran into Sandra occasionally, but less and less over time, because her mother's antics affected both her father's career and her own job to varying degrees. Some people sighed, some ridiculed, some watched the drama unfold. Even my mom couldn't help but say, it's a good thing you got out of that mess early, or we would have been affected too. What's wrong with that family? I said nothing to that. Later, I ran into Makoto once. He had a new relationship. He apologized to me, talking about his foolish past and how he's moved on now. His face was full of relief, as if he wanted to laugh off our grudges. It felt ridiculous to me. Are you really apologizing, or just seeking some psychological comfort? Mr. Ito, I have no obligation to make you feel better because you truly destroyed my marriage and family. This guilt is yours to bear. All I needed to do was cut away the dead weight and move on. I had my work and my family. A failed marriage could only hurt me for a while but would never make me suffer for life. The key was to move on in time. Chapter 15, Sandra's Perspective The first time Sandra met Makoto was shortly after his cafe opened. To deliver food on time, he asked Sandra to let him use the company's internal elevator. Sandra agreed. Later, she asked herself if she would have agreed if it were anyone else. Probably not, because Makoto caught her eye. One glance, and she couldn't forget him. The second time they met, Makoto thanked her by buying her a cup of coffee. So Sandra told her boss to get an extra card for her husband. And he gave her a special cookie he made with a secret recipe. This back and forth led to Sandra and Makoto becoming familiar with each other. Her company's afternoon tea orders went to Makoto. She exchanged contact information with him. Once, she went hiking and ran into Makoto, who also enjoyed it. Sandra felt a long-lost sense of ease. Makoto said, shall we hike together from now on? Sandra smiled but didn't agree. She felt it wasn't right. But eventually, she agreed because they met again at a concert. A concert Alex was supposed to attend with her, but he cancelled for work. Sandra didn't say it, but she was disappointed. Makoto's presence filled that disappointment. They found they had so many similar interests. Such compatibility fascinated Sandra. In casual conversation, she mentioned she made desserts for Alex every day. Makoto was envious. If a woman made me desserts every day, I'd love her to death. Sandra's heart raced. Shall I make some for you? Really? Of course. Sandra thought it was harmless just making one more portion. So later, on Valentine's Day, Makoto said, being single for so long, I can't stand the smell of love. An employee named Shaoli received 13 pieces of matcha chocolate today. I'm so jealous. It makes me want to fall in love, without thinking. Sandra responded. Do you have to be in love to receive chocolates? I'll give you some. Sandra didn't think deeply. At that moment, was she hoping Makoto wouldn't fall in love? Did Sandra like Makoto? She probably did. But whether this liking was related to love, Sandra hadn't thought about it. But she knew Makoto's liking was related to love. How could she not know? Women are most sensitive about these things. But she didn't want Makoto to say it. She couldn't give Makoto what he wanted. And didn't want to. She had a happy family and a loving husband. To her, Makoto could only be a friend. But Makoto still confessed in the end. This pained Sandra immensely. So much so that she didn't want to see Alex. As if Alex's existence was an obstacle. Sandra didn't respond to Makoto. Makoto pretended he hadn't asked. They continued their previous interactions, but there were differences. For instance, Makoto's increasingly intimate gestures. For instance, Sandra's hesitation about having the baby. Sandra was pregnant. Half a month after Makoto asked that question, she should have been happy. She should have told Alex immediately, but she didn't. She sat in the car for an hour, tore up the diagnosis, and went to meet Makoto for karaoke. Sandra was confused, thinking and thinking. The baby, Alex, Makoto. She needed to think it over. That night, she lost control. They hugged and kissed. Makoto unbuttoned her clothes. Just short of the final step, Sandra pushed him away. No. She said, not now. She hadn't decided yet. She was married. She was pregnant. She needed more time. But she didn't know she was out of time. Because Alex found out. When Sandra opened the door and saw Alex, her heart sank. At first, Sandra didn't think it was serious. Or rather, she deliberately deceived herself. She just made a friend. A friend she got along with well. She didn't cheat. Didn't betray Alex. Alex could be angry. Upset. She would apologize. But that was it. Divorce. That was too much. Since Alex found out, Sandra's emotions were tight. Constantly jumping between guilt and irritation. When Alex was sad and hurt, she felt guilty. But when he kept mentioning divorce, she got irritated. She just made a mistake. A mistake not serious enough to be unforgivable. Why couldn't he forgive her once? Sandra didn't understand. Until her dad asked for a divorce. During that time, Sandra was in a bad mood. Her mom would complain along with her. Complaining that Alex was immature. Unforgiving. It wasn't a big deal. 
but he made it seem like the sky was falling. Life isn't a novel or a fantasy. It can't always be perfect. Every family has its problems. No one is completely clean to get through life. Sometimes you have to turn a blind eye. This was said at the dinner table. Her dad thought for a moment and said, so you think this isn't a big deal? Her mom didn't find it strange, just said indifferently, of course not. What's the big deal? That's how the world is now. That's how the world is now. So her dad said, I fell in love with someone else. Let's divorce. I'll leave with nothing. Her dad had been with that girl for two years. Had to call her a girl. After all, she was two years younger than Sandra. Her dad said it was the first time he liked someone this much. I've sacrificed so much for family and career. Can't I live for myself once? Listening to her dad talk about his relationship with that girl, Sandra felt slapped in the face. How similar. Her dad and that girl. She and Makoto. How similar. She felt stripped naked in public. Humiliated. Pained. Ashamed. But she couldn't run away. Because her mom fainted. If your dad hadn't mentioned divorce but had a close female friend, would you empathize with your dad or feel sorry for your mom? Your dad's relationship with this woman didn't start yesterday. Why did he mention divorce now? Alex's two questions were a wake-up call. Sandra finally understood. You only feel the pain when the knife is in your own flesh. What made her decide on divorce was her mom's hysterical outburst. You're just like your dad. The same excuses for cheating. Disgusting. Alex said. Can you stop disgusting me? He said. At least your dad admits he fell for someone else. You don't even dare admit it. Sandra. You're worse than your dad. Sandra trembled. Crying bitterly. No, it's not like that. But, didn't she hate her dad? She did. She didn't understand. She didn't even want to speak to him. She thought, does Alex hate her like that too? Sandra got scared. From that moment, she finally began to regret. 